So Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 6. Should be on these sheets if you have them. Um, Yeah, so. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye. Then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Good morning. Good to see everyone. That's usually when you say good morning back. (laughs) You guys are British. You're supposed to be so polite, right? I'm saying good morning. Everybody's just looking at me. I know I'm very good looking, but tell me good morning. (laughs) Oh, man. I'm just kidding. Let's try that again. Good morning. morning. It's good to see everyone. It's fantastic to be together. And I'm really excited about the passage I got, you know, like, hypocrite pigs, you know, dogs, it's, it's going to be an amazing morning today. <laughs> uh, but jokes aside, there's a lot of things here that spoke to my heart, and I'm excited to share that with you this morning. So um, let's, obviously we're continuing on with our passage, uh, or our passages in our study in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so today's title, I put Treating others as I'd like to be treated. You'll understand this title in a bit. Obviously, you, you have this paper here with the verses. And also in the back, you can take notes. Uh, some questions there that you, that you can take with you. Um, one of the great things that I've learned is as you hear God's word in, in the service, take notes. You know, there are things that God will speak to you just then. And if you don't take notes, if you don't remember it, like the devil can rob it from you, won't remember it exactly the same way. Uh, and then you can pray these things in, and, and these things can really, really help. So, this next passage is actually, Jesus is talking to us about relationships. So, there's actually two aspects of relationships that we're looking at this morning. So, the first one is, how do we relate to our brothers and sisters? So, look around the room. How do we relate to each other? And the other one is, how do we relate to those who oppose the gospel. Now, I've had people ask me this before. Like, what, how do I approach someone with the gospel? But I don't know if someone has actually asked me, well, how do I relate to someone that opposes the gospel, that blatantly tells me they don't want to hear it? So, Jesus actually, he anticipates that in the Christian community, you know, in our church families, Like, things aren't going to be perfect. Actually, in the contrary, he knows that we're going to have struggles. So how should we behave to our brothers and sisters, to family, uh, when they wrong us or when we feel they've wronged us? So Jesus gives us three instructions that we're going to look at today. You get to see them on, on the screen as well. So the first one is treat others how you'd like to be treated, which is the title of the sermon. The second one is sort out your heart first or our hearts first and the third is some people just aren't ready to to hear so let's take a look at the first part okay treating our hearts or treating others uh sorry treating others how you'd like to be treated so this is on verse one and two that we're going to be looking at and it says do not judge or you too will be judged for in the same way you judge others you will be judged, and with the measure you use, you will be measured, it will be measured to you. So what does this not mean? It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a court of law. You know, some people take this as a scrap the law system, we don't need it. You know, the Bible says, don't judge, so I'm not ever going to be judged. No, that's not what Jesus is talking about. It does not mean that we turn a blind eye to sin either, 
or pretend, you know, like pretending not to notice anything, to notice anybody's faults or our own faults. And it does not mean that we just avoid all criticism, okay? It would be quite hypocritical uh, to act this way. Have you, have you ever been in a situation that you've acted a bit hypocritical in, in something like that? You really don't like something, but then you pretend you do, or you really don't want to say something and you pretend it's okay? Like, in Brazil, you guys are actually, uh, the English in American culture is actually a blessing in some, in some ways that our Brazilian culture is not. I'll give you an example. So, in Brazil, if you go to someone's house, and let's say they're serving something that you just despise, you eat it anyways. It's very rude <laughs> to not eat it, you know? Obviously, you guys get a, like a buy car because you're outsiders. They, we can just say, no, no, in, in England, they don't do it that way, you know? They just, you know? But for us, if I go to a Brazilian person's house, and they put a big plate, you know? And I've done this because pastors, we visit a lot of people's houses, right? And we go for lunch a lot. And then people go, they serve this huge plate. Pastor, you look thin. Please eat this stuff. And then it's like stuff, oh, my goodness, what do I do with this stuff? And then you're moving it in the plate back and forth, and you don't know what to do with it. You know, and then uh, finally you find some way to get rid of it. And then they're like, oh, you're finished. You like it. Here, have some more. Boom. And you're like, start all over again because you cannot say the truth. You know, it will be rude. But actually, Jesus is saying, like, to act this way, it's quite hypocritical, right? And Jesus is condemning hip hypocrisy on our next text. So obviously that's not what Jesus is talking about. God blessed us with critical thinking, and we are to use critical thinking. So what is Jesus saying? What he's saying is we are to be a critic in the sense of using our powers of discernment, but we aren't the judge. We aren't to be censorious or hypercritical. So I learned this word, censorious. Uh, so I'm going to dissect this word with you guys a little bit. If we have some English teachers here, you guys will be pleased, I, I hope. So, we assess people critically. What Jesus is saying is, we assess people critically, but we don't judge them harshly. Do you see the difference? You, are, you assess critically, but you don't judge harshly. So, what is a censorious person or an overcritical person? A censorious person is someone that is a fault finder. Have you ever been around someone that just finds fault? Or have you ever been that person that only finds fault? We are usually that way, especially if we are aggravated or annoyed. Have you ever seen a couple and they're annoyed at each other? It's just like boom, 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 like finger pointing all the time, finding faults. I did this, oh, you did that, I did, you know. So we've all been there. So a censorious person is a fault finder, is a negative and dis, uh, destructive towards other people. So this person is negative and destructive towards other people. A uh, censorious person enjoys actively seeking others' faults or others' failings. Have you ever been in that situation where either someone's doing that to you or you've done that to someone else? where you're constantly just looking at their failings over and over, or someone is constantly just looking at our shortcomings over and over and over. We never feel good enough. Not a good place to be. A censorious person paints a negative scene on other people's motives on doing something constructive. Now, a lot of you guys have only been in Sunbridge Road Mission, and this is a little piece of heaven, but I've been around, I've been in a lot of different churches, and even in the midst of churches, we have people that when you try to do something really nice and you're excited, you know, or if you're a young Christian and you're full of life, and there's, hmm, that's just like, uh, like uh, in Brazil we call um, palha, como é que é palha? Um, uh, when you have like dry weeds, dry grass, you know, like on those fields, it's like, oh, that's, just a uh, dry grass fire. That means like it comes up, but it'll soon go away. You know, they try to squash it immediately. So even in the church, in our midst of Christians, we have this kind of thinking sometimes. You know, someone's trying to do something really excited, and you know, always just pointing all the negatives. You know, I, I can give you some here. You know, I know some stuff, so I'm going to get some personal stuff with us. 
You know, some crazy guy paints the crash black. And then, you know, no one says it to his face. But then, you know, it's like, why is the crash black? What's going on in this church? You know, like this kind of stuff happens even amongst ourselves. So I've done this. I've criticized things even when people have tried to do something nice. So this is a place where we've all been. Uh, A censorious person is someone that is ungenerous towards other people's mistakes. Now, we hate when people are ungenerous to our mistakes, right? We want grace. But how often are we quite ungenerous to other people's mistakes? Most of the time, when we are acting censorious, we are criticizing something without actually trying to find out where is the root of that. Like, why is this happening? Why did this person act this way? Why is this going on in, in the building? Why is this going on? You know, why did we have to move this, you know? Uh, I love it when people come ask questions. So this week, because of some changes we've had to make, some people sent me messages as, Pastor, what's going on? Are we moving uh, the kids to the lounge? What's going to happen to the kids that are in the lounge? Fantastic. That's exactly what we need to do. Let's talk to one another. See what's, find out what the reason is behind, if you haven't heard, instead of us being so critical and hypercritical. You know, and Jesus is telling us, be careful. Don't do this. To be censorous is to become the censor yourself. To be censorous is to claim the competence and authority to sit in the judge's seat. It's making me judge. It's actually putting myself in God's place. I'm God. I know what's best. I judge everyone. But the Bible says we've all sinned. We've all come, you know, we've short of God's glory. So which of us actually have the kind of capacity to actually judge a brother or sister? But how many times have I judged wrong? I'm speaking this to myself. How many times have I heard something or didn't know something or didn't know someone's motive and I just quickly just, you know, either gossiped or judged or even thought the wrong thing, right? So this is something that is probably in all our hearts. And it's not something easy to deal with if we're honest. So the thing is, what Jesus is telling us is that if we pose as judges, we will be judged more strictly. Because how can we... You know, how can we plead ignorance to a law that we, well, we uh, claim that we have the ability and the knowledge to administer, right? So if I'm in the judge's seat and I know everything there is about this law and all the rules and all this stuff, how can I plead ignorance? Oh, I didn't know that, you know? We can't. It's much more strict. I'll give you a funny example that happened in my family. When I was a little kid, I must have been, I don't know, nine or eight. We were all eating pizza in in Sao Paulo in my parents, like in my, what, our house. And my uncle, who also worked at the church, he was there with his kid. And his kid was maybe like four, you know, and and his voice was really like high pitched. Like, hey, dad, you know, like that. And then we're all eating pizza. And my my uncle, he's my dad's youngest brother. He's been through the army, so he's kind of like a general, you know. And then his son, Samuel, and went, Dad, uh, I don't like onions on my pizza. And then he goes, Samuel, who made onions? And then he's like, God. <laughs> and everything God makes is good? Yes. So eat the onions. <laughs> okay. So the little boy, you know, goes and tries to eat the onions. And then a piece of pizza came to, to my uh, uncle, and he goes to his wife, Marsha, you know I don't like olives. <laughs> what do you think happened? <laughs> Little Samuel comes, Dad! <laughs> yes, yeah, Samuel. Who made olives? <laughs> God. And everything God makes is good. And then it was like a choir, the whole family. Eat it! (laughs) So do you see? The same measure is going to be used with us. Now, I'll show you something else.
I have a measure here. This is Leo. Leo is the cook at our house. So imagine if I went to buy something, go back in Jesus' time, and someone went to buy, I don't know, coffee ground or something. I don't know what they sold there. But like, and then they said, uh, you came to buy from me. And then I said, one cup is five pounds. And then they're like, okay, here's a cup. And then we weigh it. You pay me five pounds. And then I was like, okay, now I'd like to buy some flour from you. And then they're like, oh, one cup is also five pounds. And then I'll bring my cup. There you go. You know, do you think that would work? The guy was like, no. Like, well, then give me the coffee on your cup as well. You know, that's what Jesus is talking about. Whatever measurement you use with someone else, the same measurement is going to come right back at you. Right? So he's saying, don't be so quick to judge. You know, let's look. Let's be, be a bit more careful in how we, we, we take things on. We shouldn't be surprised or complain when others judge us by our own standards. That is why the church has had a lot of bad rap from unchristians. One time I heard when I worked in America uh, that the statistics was that most people would say they didn't go to church because of another Christian. They said they're all hypocritical. They say one thing, but they act another way. They judge me in this, but I don't see that in their lives. What a horrible testimony for us, right? But Jesus says they'll know we are Christians by our love. So let's learn this. This is hard. It's not easy. It's not, we're not going to leave here today and everyone's sorted, right? But let's learn this together. Uh, Jesus' command not to judge, he's not telling us to be blind, but rather to be generous. So the second bit is sort out your heart first. So first he's saying don't be too quick to judge. You know, treat others as you want, you'd like to be treated. The measure you use is going to be used for you. But actually, sort out your heart first. Look inwardly first. Look what it says in verse 3 to 5. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your eye, then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. Jesus here is exposing our hypocrisy in relationship to others. Now, it's not comfortable. Who in the world likes to be exposed as a hypocrite, right? But don't we have the tendency to be very, to, to exaggerate with other people's faults and minimize the seriousness of our own faults? You know, a hypocritical spirit is ungodly and false righteousness that is always looking for something wrong in someone else is unchristlike. So, Let's, uh, let's, uh, let me show you this with an example. I'm going to need some volunteers, though. Could I have, would there be a brave couple to just come stand here for me? You won't do much. I just got to sh show you something. <laughs> so it would be better if it's a couple because then you feel more comfortable with each other. Who wants to come? I can call someone, but I'd rather you just be brave and volunteer. Come on, who's coming? Do you want to come? You're pointing at your husband, so come on, you both come. Because that means you're included, Natasha. Come on. You're pointing at him. No? Oh, Tom, you and Georgia, come. You guys do it. Young people are good. All right. So we got Tom and Georgia here. So, Georgia, thanks for being here. <laughs> uh, can you pretend that you have a speck in your eye? Like, have you ever had something in your eye? Like, how... Like, show them what you'd be like if you had something in your eye, right? And have, have all of us have been like this, right? Oh, my goodness, there's just something, I just can't get it out. And you try to get it out. Eventually, you ask for help. And then Tom would, like, probably blow her in her eye or do something like that, right? Or try to see, <laughs> or try to see what's in there, you know? Like, or try to see, you know? But he's not going to get, a, like, a leaf blower. Boom! You know, he's going to be very delicate because the eye is sensitive. But... Imagine this. <laughs> so, 
So let me show you something. This is a little piece of saw uh, dust, okay? But it's not a speck. This is actually a little piece of like, this I use for linen in my rabbit's stuff, but this one's clean, don't worry. But <laughs> <laughs> so this is very small, right? You can even see it. But obviously this would be too big to be in her eye, okay? She could easily remove that. Uh, when we have something that's bothering our eye, it's actually something that we can barely see. Have you ever got like a hair in your eye? It's just like, you can even see it goes around and you're trying to get it out. But now imagine, can you guys come closer so they can hear me? So Tom, pretend that that was in your eye, okay? <laughs> you know? So cover, cover both of your eyes with it. Now, this is a very small plank, okay? This is just a piece of Pastor Matthew's fireplace stuff that he lent me, okay? But a huge plank like stuck in your eye. How can he see? You know? He's like, here, Georgia, let me move that little dust in your eye. He can't even help. He can't even see what's going on, you know? So that's, Jesus is exaggerating. Thanks, guys. Jesus is exaggerating, but he's trying to make us see, like, do you see how hypocritical this is when we try to fix other people when we ourselves have loads of stuff in our own lives? Aren't we so good, and I include myself in this, aren't we so good at fixing other people but not that great at fixing ourselves, you know? And you need to exercise. I never go to the gym, you know? <laughs> it's like, how can I say that, you know? Uh, we, we do stuff like that all the time. We have all the answers for someone else's life, but we ourselves struggle. So the picture is, is clear, you know? Um, we sometimes, you know, we are optimistic. We have a very optimistic view of ourselves in a very pessimistic view of others. We use a microscope to analyze someone else's problem, and we use a telescope backwards to look at our own sin, right? Make it really small. Now, I can share about my own life. You know, uh, when I first got married with Leticia, the first few years we had a lot of adjustments, and I thought, you know, it's like, I'm seven years older, I'm so much wiser. God, you need to fix this woman. You know, <laughs> she's like, it's clearly it's her fault. You know, I've never had problems like this. You know, it's I don't know what she's complaining about. You know, sort her out. Have you ever thought like that as a husband? How dumb was I? You know, <laughs> then I learned, you know, uh, she was 99.9% .9 usually correct, you know, <laughs> and then. God was actually, look, this, don't worry about her. Like, I'll deal with her. I'm here to deal with you. You know, tell me the stuff that's in your heart. Tell me what you're really struggling. What is this even about? You know, have you ever put yourself in her shoes to understand why she's saying this to you? Oh, yeah, okay, God, yeah. You know, and I'm still tempted to act this way. Right? To be honest, it's not just in my marriage. I've acted this way in many ways. When I was a footballer, the coach has no idea what he's doing. I should be playing. I'm way better than that other guy. You know? Why am I on the bench? <laughs> Why do I need to do this? So I had all the answers, right? No, I was wrong. So God's still working, you know, but I am learning. I'm getting better at not being so stubborn or so, you know, take so long to actually hear what God has to say. But if I'm completely honest with you, it's, it's not a weekly thing. It's not a monthly thing. It's a daily thing. I have to come to Jesus every day. Jesus, put my heart in check. You know, align my heart with yours. And I use this here, his word. What does it say? Yeah, yeah, I'm going this way. Align my thoughts with yours. Align my desires with yours. Align the way I speak with how you, you want me to speak. Help me. Mold me. I'm messing up again. I can't believe I'm thinking this stuff again. I'm talking like this again. I'm criticizing again. I'm angry again. I have to constantly come to him to put my heart in check. And this one, this question really spoke to me when I was preparing this. I'll read it so I get it right says, is it possible that we are seeing our own faults in others and judging them as a substitute to ourselves? 
So I'll say that again. Is it possible that when we are being hypercritical and we're trying to fix others, that we're actually judging our own faults in them instead of as a substitute for ourselves? And then I was trying to see, where do I see this stuff? And one easy example for you to, to understand is I see this in my children. When I see their like, faults in them that I know came from me, that hurts, you know. Why? And I get angry sometimes. And then I start acting, actually, I'm angry at me, you know. Like, this came from me. Just like they inherit the blessings God has given me, they've also inherited my faults, and I have to try to help them work things out. But so many times I'm so harsh on them. But actually, I'm trying to be harsh on me, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> and Jesus says, you hypocrite. Because it appears like kindness, right? Oh, let me move the speck in your eye. I'm doing you a favor. But how is that a favor if you can't even see where my eye is, right? Well, you're going to cause a lot more damage than help. Shouldn't we at least apply to ourselves the same strict and critical standard that we use on others when we criticize them? Shouldn't we do that to us? So what Jesus is calling us to be here is, hey, let's be loving brothers and sisters to one another. Let's be full of grace with one another. Because by removing the log from your eye, you're actually going to be able to see clearly to actually help someone else. It's easier to be compassionate with someone once you've been through what they've been through. So my brother went through cancer. He has a whole different approach to someone that is dealing with cancer. He knows what it's like to lose all his hair. He knows what it's like to be swelled up by chemotherapy. You know, he knows what it's like to not have the answers, to not know if you're going to live. You know, so he knows. And he has a connection that I don't have with people that are going through that. So, the procedure of removing a speck from someone's eye, as Georgia showed us so well, is very delicate, right? It's very delicate. You have to blow really soft. You've got to use, like, you know, eye drops. It's a delicate thing. So actually, we are to approach our brothers and sisters when they are in wrong or when they're going through trouble or when they're going through something that's hard with that same delicacy and that same carefulness as removing a speck from the eye. The eye is the most sensitive, one of the most sensitive organs in the body. I don't think Jesus used that uh, as an accident. We are to treat each other very delicate. So... A question for us to ask as, before we move on. Who have I been critical to lately? Has my focus on their faults blinded me to my own faults? Maybe you arrived here this morning being very critical of your wife, of your husband, of your child, of your neighbor, of yourself. Of, I don't know, you know. Jesus is not condemning criticism or corrections as such, but rather the mindset of assessing others when we don't have the same rigorous attitude in assessing ourselves. So let's not play the judge or hypocrite in relationships with others. Let's be gracious, brothers and sisters, assessing ourselves so and seeking to sort out our hearts first. Then we can actually be constructive in how we help someone else. We need to be as critical to ourselves, of ourselves, as we often are of others, and as generous to others as we always or of ourselves. And the last point. Some people are, aren't ready to hear. This is from verse 6. It says, Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Have you ever noticed that some people act like animals? And then you're like, what? How do people act like animals? Have you ever seen, uh, well, uh, when someone is hurt uh, emotionally or some way, like if you get close to them, they turn into like a porcupine. You know, whoosh, and they just <laughs> dish out a bunch of stuff. Sometimes we see that in marriage, right? The husband just dishing out, 
you know, uh, spy, uh, is it, what, what do you call that? Pines, that for, like a porcupine, you know, uh, just poking at each other all the time, looking at each other's faults all the time. Or when we try, you try to come to someone and, and approach them to help them in some way, and they come at you like a ram, you know, like headbutt first and pushing you away, you know, or like a snake, just ready to, to pounce on you. You know, sometimes we see that. But we are not to be hypercritical. We are to assess ourselves first. But Jesus is saying, beware. Not everyone is ready to receive what you have to offer. Some won't recognize the value of what you are giving them. Let me show you this. So, I have a card here. With 50 pounds, okay? And I have a biscuit. So when my kids were young, I enjoyed doing this kind of stuff, just my silly sense of humor. I would go to them when they were like two, and I'd be like, Luca, do you want this or do you want this? And then he just grabbed the biscuit because that's all he knows, right? <laughs> Son, you can buy hundreds, maybe even thousands of these with this, with this 50 pound bill. He wasn't bothered, you know. He'd just eat the biscuits. And if I tried to keep the biscuit from him, he'd probably cry. Now, let's try that again, but let's do this change the biscuit to a little dog treat, okay? Then you go to my next door neighbor. He has a huge pit bull. And you come with a 50 pound bill and the treat. And you say, eh, which one do you want? And then once he chooses the treat, actually try to take it from him and make the argument that with 50 pounds he can buy loads of treats and see where you get to. <laughs> you see, like, it's not going to go very well, is it? But why? Because he doesn't have the understanding. He hasn't had the knowledge, you know, like that hasn't been open to him yet. He doesn't get it. You can show him anything, but he's ignorant in this thing, Right? So with the pit bull, not only will he choose the, the, the tree, but he will attack you, right? He'll tear you to pieces. And that's what Jesus is saying. You know, uh, basically, it's, do not correct a fool or he will hate you. Correct a wise person and they will appreciate you. In Proverbs, um, it will come up there on the next one. It says, if you correct someone who makes fun of wisdom, you will get insulted. You will, if you correct an evil person you will get hurt. Do not correct someone who makes fun of wisdom, or he will hate you. But correct a wise man, and he will love you. Teach a wise man, and he will become even wiser. Teach a good man, and he will learn even more. Proverbs 9, 7 through 9. It's hard to teach those people that don't want to learn or not bother. I'm, there, were, there are a lot of teachers here, and I know, what you, you, know you understand what I mean. So who then is Jesus saying that are dogs and pigs? Because this is quite harsh comparison, right? In the Bible it says in 2 Peter 2.22 that a dog returns to its vomit or, or he eats what he throws up. In a pig, you know, that is washed. If you wash a pig but you let him go, he ends up going back to the mud and he's going to roll in it. So what is this talking about? It's unbelievers... Or people without the Holy Spirit, that is, people without God living in them, are unlikely to behave in ways that are likely to behave in ways that won't be very pleasant or fun to be around at times. My father told me something when I was young, and he's repeated this to me several times. And he talked about it in business, but he talked about it in relationships, like, you know, when I chose a wife. He talked about it like in relationships when I chose friends. He talked about it, how I carried myself, what I invested in, where I looked for, where I went to school, people that I associated with. He said, son, have no business with impious, with the impious. So you don't use this word so much in English. We use it in Portuguese, but this is a word. He says, don't, no business with the impious. What is an impious person? It's someone that shows no, a lack, it shows a lack of respect for God. Godless, ungodly, or wicked. 
So someone that shows a lack of respect for God. I'm not talking about not knowing God. I'm talking about a lack of respect. You know, disrespect, uh, ungodliness, wickedness. Have no business with them. Don't even associate with them. The pearl, or what is sacred, that is mentioned here in verse 6, is the kingdom of God, is the gospel. So does that mean that we don't share the gospel with unbelievers? No, that's not what it means. The pigs or dogs here refer to those who have had an ample opportunity to hear and receive the good news, but have decisively or even defiantly rejected it. John Calvin puts it this way. People who, by clear evidence, have manifested a hardened contempt of God so that their disease appears to be incurable. So, to persist with the gospel, with people with this kind of attitude, is to waste your time, and it could bring trouble to you. It could invite trouble. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 10, 14, If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. There's another verse in the Bible that says, don't even leave your peace with them. You know, shake the dust off your feet. So if we share the gospel, giving several opportunities for a person to hear and to respond, and they stubbornly turn their backs to Christ, even to the point of disrespecting the gospel or trampling on these pearls, we are to keep insisting. We are to move on, shake the dust off our feet. If they keep mocking you, attacking you, no intention of hearing what you have to say. Move on. Don't waste your time with them. They aren't ready to hear. They don't want to hear. So don't throw your pearls to pigs. So let's remember this morning those three points that I've mentioned. We need to treat others as we would like to be treated. So don't be too quick to judge. Sort our hearts out first in order to help someone else. And remember, some people might not be ready to hear what you have to say. So don't waste pearls on pigs. Ask God for discernment. Let's pray together. Father God, we praise you for your word. Father, I know that some of the things we've heard this morning are hard. Sometimes we can even hear them as an offense. But Father, you know that is not the desire of my heart. And I certainly know that's not the desire of Jesus' heart. Uh, Lord, we pray that from this morning, from your teaching, from your words, we will take that. If it's bothering us, if it's tugging at our hearts, Father, if it's a bit sore, it's probably because it's something we need to work on. And Father, I know as I've read this and studied this, there's a lot that probably all of it was right directed in my heart. And I need to change a lot. And I praise you that I am changing. I praise you that you are working in me, that you haven't given up. I praise you for putting friends and family around me that help uh, with my wife, starting with Leticia and the many people, Father, that see my faults and love me anyways and show grace to me. So we pray, Lord, that we will hear what we need to hear, that you would sharpen us, that you would use your words to instruct us, to heal us, to bless us. Uh, to transform us into your likeness. Help us, Lord, we pray, uh, to see ourselves as we are, to see others as we like them to see us through your eyes, and give us the discernment in where and in whom we need to invest our treasures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.